हेलो स्टूडेंट्स वेलकम टू द सेकंड लेक्चर ऑफ द फाइनल सेगमेंट लीनियर एलजेब्रा विल स्टार्ट विद अ वेरी क्विक रिव्यू ऑफ व्हाट वी डिड इन द लास्ट लेक्चर सो वी डिफाइन क्वाड्रेटिक फॉर्म्स एंड वी सेड दैट एवरी क्वाड्रेटिक फॉर्म कैन बी रिटर्न यूनिकली एज एक्स ट्रांसपोर्ट ए एक्स वेर ए इज अमेट्रिक मेट्रिक सो इफ द क्वाड्रेटिक फॉर्म हैज एन वेरिएबल्स देन ए इज एन क्रॉस एन सिमेट्रिक एंड एक्स इज द वेक्टर दैट कंटेन्स द वेरिएबल ओके Uh, we further said that uh, if lambda one, lambda two, so on up to lambda n are the eigenvalues of the matrix A, and we know the matrix A has n eigenvalues, it is diagonalizable because it is symmetric by the spectral theorem, uh, and we assume that these eigenvalues are arranged in ascending order. So lambda one is the smallest eigenvalue, and lambda n is the largest eigenvalue. Uh, then we had one main result that we looked at in the last uh, lecture. We'll call it theorem one, which says that the quadratic form x transpose a x is bounded between, meaning its largest value is lambda n x transpose x, and its smallest value is lambda one x transpose x. Okay, so this is the result that we looked at in the last class, right? In particular, if x is a unit vector, meaning x transpose x is equal to one, then uh, This means that the quadratic form x transpose a x is always between lambda one and lambda n, always between the smallest eigenvalue and the largest eigenvalue. Another way sometimes people write this is uh, uh, they'll simply write lambda min uh, x transpose x less than or equal to x transpose a x less than or equal to lambda max x transpose x. Right? Lambda min denotes the smallest eigenvalue of the matrix, and lambda max denotes the largest eigenvalue of the matrix. Okay, uh, <coughs> this is what we looked at in the last picture. We even the proof. Okay, uh, today uh, what we are going to do is we are going to look at some conceptual implications of uh, uh, of this theorem uh, and some general ones. In the next lecture, we will look at some practical applications. One of the most Popular applications of this theorem is what is called self-functioning parameter. Okay. Uh, in the previous segment, uh, reading materials were already shared with you. I urge all of you to go through it. That is the most, uh, uh, most uh, uh, what do you call it? Most difficult application of uh, of this theorem. Uh, also, there are many methods to find the largest eigenvalue of matrix. They all rely on this theorem. So one of them is the power method, which we'll we'll go through very briefly, possibly in the next lecture, <laughs> and many more. Right? We'll come across and we'll run into this theorem many many times. Okay. So <coughs> let us try to <coughs> dive a bit deeper uh, into this. Okay. Um, uh, one common way that you can find people writing this is uh, they'll actually shift this term x transpose x. Uh, they'll move this term here. Okay. Uh, if you do that, you'll actually get something like this: x transpose a x by x transpose. You know, this quantity is between lambda min and lambda max. This quantity over here, uh, this quotient, is called the Rayleigh quotient. It's given a name called the Rayleigh. Okay, if x is a unit vector, then the Rayleigh quotient is same as the quadratic form. Okay, so that x is a unit vector, then the denominator just becomes small, and you get the quadratic form. Okay, so this is uh, the so basically this result uh, theorem one is actually saying that the Rayleigh quotient lies between the smallest and the largest. Okay, sometimes this is also called the Rayleigh quotient theorem. Okay, just so that we know what we mean when we refer to it, it's called the Rayleigh quotient theorem. And this Rayleigh quotient theorem has to do with bounds on the Rayleigh quotient. Okay, uh, in some sense, sometimes it's also called a variational characterization. Okay, variational meaning it tries to understand how the Rayleigh quotient varies, right? How large can it be? How small can it be? Right? So you use the term variational rule to go also into the mix in times when talking about results such as these. Okay. Uh, another way people will write this result sometimes is they will say max of x transpose a x by x transpose x okay, is equal to lambda max. Okay, 
So we'll say that max of this quantity. So when you say max of any any function, it means the maximum value of that function. So here here x is your variable, right? So if you pick different values of x and you know you look at the value of the variable first, what is the largest value you can get? So that is essentially random. And the largest value you will get provided you pick x to be the largest eigenvector, x, pick x to be eigenvector corresponding to lambda. Okay, so you pick x to be the eigenvector corresponding to lambda. That gives you the maximum value. Okay, okay. By the way, just a minor technical detail this quotient here is defined, well defined only in the denominator of one bit, right? Of course. So people will usually put something like this, right? maximum uh, over all x non zero because when, when x is zero it doesn't make sense to talk of the ratio anyway, right? Because both numerator and denominator are actually equal. Okay. <coughs> so that is uh, basically the Rayleigh quotient theorem. So uh, one very powerful way to use the Rayleigh quotient theorem is as follows: suppose you took some x, so some arbitrary x, and evaluate the Rayleigh. And uh, let's say your really quotient evaluates to something like you know, 2. Okay? So you took some x and you evaluate this really quotient, and let's say it evaluates to a 7 example 2. Okay? Then what does that tell you? That tells you that for the matrix A, there is at least one eigenvalue that either 2 or 1, and there is at least one eigenvalue that is 2 or 1. That is a quite powerful information about the eigenvalue. In particular, if this really quotient can be evaluated very, very easily. Okay, so let's look at an example. So let, let me write down one result and we see how it's powerful. Right? All the diagonal entries of a similar equation. Lie between the lambda and the lambda. So all the diagonal symmetric faces lie between lambda and lambda. This is actually a very, very interesting and very minimal of line. Uh, but uh, uh, any idea from how to prove this? So this is how we'll go about doing this, right? We'll just pick x to be the simplest vector b, the simplest non zero state. The simplest vectors we know are the transition, and vectors which are zero most of the people except at one position where they are equal to one. For example, if I took x to be this vector, okay, the vector is one, the very first coordinate zero everywhere else. Okay, we call this e1, right? So the first standard will okay. But arguably you can think of this as a simplest vector that you have, right? So let's try to evaluate the real equation at e1. Or the quadratic form. So what happens when you do E1 transpose A E1? Okay. Uh, E1 transpose A E1, you see E1, all the coordinates are 0 except 1. So when you actually expand it out the quadratic form, all the terms will become 0 except 1 square. Okay. And that's just going to be equal to A1. Okay. And first all of you to check this is this algebra. You can just check with this first out. Should be very apparent from you know discussion from the uh, so we wrote down an expansion of x transpose a x in fact a generic expansion of this quadratic form of x okay so e1 transpose a e1 will actually be equal to e1 this is the first diagonal of the first diagonal okay. So what does that tell you, right? And of course, uh, if you want to do the real equation, you have to divide by e1 transpose e1, but that's really, you know, and e1 is a unit vector, right? So the denominator is just going to So the real equation actually evaluates to e1, 1. Okay. And what does that tell you? That tells you from theorem, from the real equation theorem, that any value of the real equation is between lambda and lambda. In particular, this happens to be a value of the real equation. And so it must be between lambda and lambda. Okay. Now you can do the same thing, of course, for the second diagonal. This is the third diagonal. So simplify to two different unit vectors. 
here you pick E1, if you pick E2, you will get A22. That will tell you that A22 is between lambda and lambda. So all the diagonal entries of uh, of a symmetric matrix are between the smallest and the largest of This is actually quite powerful because it gives you some information about the eigenvalue without actually having to compute them. For example, let us say that you have a symmetric matrix A whose uh, one of whose eigenvalues is one of whose diagonal entries is one. Okay, so I have a symmetric matrix A and let us say you have a bunch of entries here and one of the diagonal entries is one and another diagonal entry is minus one and it has some other odd values. The only information I have is that it's got two diagonal entries, one of which is one diagonal minus one, it may be here. The other diagonal entries will be something like that. Now applying this theorem, what this tells you is that there is at least one eigenvalue that's above one. At least one eigenvalue that is greater than or equal to one. Okay. And at least one eigenvalue that is less than or equal to one. Okay. So without doing any computation, you know right away that at least one eigenvalue Lambda min is going to be at most lambda. Okay, so if you have to draw like you know, like number line or something like that, you have minus one and you have one. You know that lambda max lies somewhere here and lambda min lies somewhere here. So okay? this is the location where you expect lambda max to be, and this is the location where you expect lambda min to be, just by looking at the diagonal matrix. Okay, very good. <coughs> Let me look at uh, you know another. Uh, uh, another such uh, conceptual implication of uh, of the Rayleigh quotient theorem. Uh, uh, we all deal with in many contexts. We have to deal with sums of uh, you know uh, uh, sums of uh, matrices, right? So A and B are both symmetric matrices. You may have to sum the matrices A and B. Now, in general, it's not clear what happens to the eigenvalues of this sum. Correct. Uh, if you know the eigenvalues of A, if you know the eigenvalues of B, the eigenvalues of the sum may not be the sum of the eigenvalues, right? So it doesn't really work that way. I I, I request you to actually look at an example to actually claim that. Okay. Example. Uh, show by you no know, show by example that the eigenvalues of sum need not be sums of eigenvalues okay and you can just do that by picking a to be let's say the uh, you know one a, a to be one matrix some pick some example two cross two matrix and just work out uh, the algebra okay. uh, so the sums of eigen the eigenvalues of the sum of matrices is a bit complicated it's not really clear uh, how they work out right uh, but we can actually come up with some very simple inequalities just using the Rayleigh quotient theory. For example, suppose I am interested in the largest eigenvalue of a plus b, right? The largest eigenvalue of a plus b, right? Uh, uh, what I can say is that the largest eigenvalue is actually at most the largest eigenvalue of a plus the largest eigenvalue of b. Let's see why this is the case, okay? The largest eigenvalue of a plus b is less than or equal to the largest eigenvalue of a plus largest eigenvalue of b. So, how do you go about showing this? Uh, well, it's uh, uh, in this construct. So, eigenvalues are tied to you know the Rayleigh quotient by the uh, you know Rayleigh quotient theorem. So, let's try to construct the Rayleigh quotient theorem. To simplify, let's just assume x is a unit vector. And let's construct x transpose a plus b x. Right. So, we all know by the Rayleigh quotient theorem that uh, sorry uh, let me just uh, this is lambda min i'm talking about here not lambda max that's right it's lambda max okay i'm going to come to the lambda min result in a minute sorry okay so let's just do x transpose ax and x transpose a plus bx uh, just by expanding this out this is going to be x transpose ax Sorry, there is a spurious transpose there plus x transpose bx. Right? <coughs> this comes just by you know expanding it. 
Now this quantity over here, x is a unit vector, remember, is bounded above by lambda max of a. Okay. So by the way, when I say lambda max of a, I mean the largest eigenvalue of a. And when I say lambda max of b, I mean the largest eigenvalue of b. Okay. And this quantity over here is going to be bounded by lambda max of b. Correct. This is coming from the Rayleigh quotient theorem because x is a unit vector. Just write that down here. X is a unit vector. That tells you that x transpose a x is at most lambda max a x transpose b x is at most lambda max b. Okay, that tells you that this quantity over here is going to be less than or equal to lambda max a lambda max b. Right? No matter what x is. Right? What does that mean? That means that if I if I look at the maximum possible value of the left hand side, right? If I look at the maximum possible value of the left hand side, that must also be less than or equal to lambda max a plus lambda max b. Okay. So this basically means that the maximum value must be less than or equal to lambda max a plus lambda max b. Correct? And what is the maximum value of this? Again, by the Rayleigh quotient theorem, that's equal to lambda max of a plus b. So that's it. this actually proves the theorem, right? So uh, you can actually come up with some very useful, interesting inequalities like this, just keeping an eye on the maximum and minimum values of the quadratic forms involved. Okay. Let me just do one more inequality and we'll stop this part here. Uh, this is about the minimum eigenvalue that I was talking about. Lambda min a plus b. I hope I'm correct. Let's see how this goes, right? It's less than or equal to lambda min a plus lambda max b. Okay. So the smallest eigenvalue of a plus b is at most the smallest eigenvalue of a plus the uh, largest eigenvalue of b. So how, how do we how do we go about doing this? Right? Okay. So to generate the smallest eigenvalue of a, I'm going to pick the eigenvector corresponding to the smallest eigenvalue of a. Okay. So let v b the eigenvector corresponding to lambda min a. Okay. So take the eigenvector corresponding to the smallest eigenvalue of a. Then let us compute the quadratic form involved. Okay. Of course, I am going to assume b to be a unit vector. Typically, when we say eigenvectors, it's uh, safe to assume without loss of generality that we are dealing with unit vectors, right? So we have v transpose a plus b v. Okay, that's going to be equal to v transpose a v plus v transpose b v. Right now, this quantity by definition of v, the way we pick v, forces this to be equal to lambda min of a. Is it? It's forced to be equal to lambda min of a because v has been picked to be the eigenvector corresponding to lambda min. So a v will be equal to lambda min a, and you plug that in, you will get lambda min. This quantity here. We don't really know what it is, but we know a bound. We know that it can at most be lambda max of b, correct, by the Rayleigh quotient theorem. We know that it can be at most lambda max of b. Okay. And what about this quantity? This quantity we know is the Rayleigh quotient associated with v, and we know that is at least equal to lambda min of a plus b. Okay. This proves your inequality. You start with lambda min of a plus b on this side. On the, on the left hand side, you have lambda min of a plus b. That's less than or equal to lambda min of a plus lambda max b. Okay. But this is just to illustrate a potential use uh, of uh, you know, uh, the Rayleigh quotient theorem. Okay. 